we live in, in, a, in a racist society, so it's inevitable that our organisations will have racist aspects of what it does, intentionally and unintentionally. So it's pointless, quite frankly, in us pretending it doesn't exist. I think it's, it's for us as leaders, all of us, to recognise it's going on in our watch and to do whatever it takes. In this case, a structured approach to diagnosing what the issues are and put in place clear plans to make a difference. I'm going to ask those panel members that haven't yet said who they are to say who they are, and then we'll open it up. So maybe. Um. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Anna from Jack, and I'm Chief Executive of Brighter Places. I've gone off a tangent already, but thinking about what the homes versus housing, well, actually, what's even worse is the intersection we call mass assets. So it further depersonalizes everything, doesn't it? Just the use of that word. Just one of my reflections. Hi, I'm Lee Sway, and I'm Chief Executive at Lawrence Homes. Hi, I'm uh, Donald Green, Director of Housing and Landlord Services for Bristol City Council. Um, I'm Una Goldsby, I'm Chief Executive at Brunel Care. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's, let's open this debate with the general question. I don't mind who wants to go first. I like volunteers more than forced. Um, which is, uh, give us some experience of it and the temp that you may have had in your own organisation to deal with issues of racism. Um, whether good or bad, what was what was the learning? What did you try and do? What was the outcome? Do you want to have maybe? Yeah, if like, I, work, I work at Alliance Homes, and when I joined the organisation, I was shown a survey that said people here, 99% of people here, feel uh, it's an inclusive culture. 99% of the people working there all looked the same. Um, it was a uh, gender split, you know, all the way through the organisation was a, was a challenge. So I think the first thing is to recognise that more needs to be done to create an inc inclusive culture and it's not going to be done overnight. It needs considered and strong leadership to drive that through the organisation, uh, baked into our values. Uh, the first value that we have is ambition because I happen to think one of the problems in our sector is low ambition for our customers, which flows through to colleagues too. Um, and making a difference, which is saying we want a diverse and um, vibrant workforce that reflects the communities. So that's, that's really important about setting that out, but um, culture does eat strategy for breakfast. <laughs> um, and things like Sharp are really, really important, and we will be adopting that. Um, but I think it is then really being clear about what it is you're trying to achieve. So one of the biggest things is making sure that we represent at a board and an exec level and a senior level the people um, uh, that we, we want that reflect that diversity. Um, and I was saying earlier, I think Fiona said it about doing something different. Or it, it's really, you've got to try really hard because there is systemic... Chad, like barriers in a system, even a system that you're running yourself, where you say, we want this to happen, if you turn your back, it's like not happening, so you have to stay really, really focused, for example, when I wanted to bring greater diversity into my executive team, which we finally got, I, you know, it was near enough exhausting to kind of push that through, but actually pushing that through and creating that environment, and um, which then does enable us to create greater diversity, and eventually it leads to better services. Um, there's been loads of things said today that have made me sit there with my toes shivered up about how backwards we have gone. Um, and I was around in the 80s. Um, and there's some really great things that I think we could pick up. Um, and I, I don't know why, I've been sitting in my chair thinking about why. And I think it's to do with the challenge in the social home sector generally has become quite different. I think we have a lot of really big challenging needs and so we need to make sure that we do champion those ones um, you know, you know, that, 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 that need, need it specifically. Um, yeah. Thank you. Anna, do you, you want to? Yeah, can do. Um, so it comes up, my organisation, we have got more white exec, we've got this in here, you know, that, that's us, we have. Um, so it's Sitting and reflecting on what can we do as an organisation differently, we we have been working with um, Aisha Thomas from Representation Matters. I don't know, lots of people probably know of Aisha, um, who's been working with us just to just to get under the skin of, of what the organisation 
what our values are, what do our colleagues think of us, what do our residents think of us. So um, we spent about 12 months doing that piece of work just to find out that we live in the land of being deluded, I think. You know, sitting on an executive going, well, it's great because we've got, you know, we don't have diversity in all forms, but isn't it great because we've got diversity of walk, we've got, you know, different ages, we've got different genders. Um, and so we needed somebody to come in and look at us from a different perspective because you can't, you can try, can't you? But actually, you need that somebody shining a light on you in a way that you can't do yourself. Um, so we really enjoyed working with Aisha. But one reflection for me with that exec, you know, that exec challenge is the 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 barriers because I'm going through this, you know, at the moment in terms of recruitment um, need need to change. And this is just a bit of an example. Um, I'm going off tangent again, but we. So I want to do something. I then talk to the employment lawyers who go, no, no, you can't do that because you have to do this, right? And how how do I then go? No, no, okay, I'll ignore your legal, you know, your legal perspective. It could end up putting me in an employment tri tribunal in the future because I want to change the diversity, right? And I don't know, having sat here and reflected on that, how to do that because actually the advice that you get from all of the professionals, and this comes back to that institutionalised, you know, it just rolls on, it just rolls on. How can you do that in a way that doesn't become reckless, you know, to the organisation in a completely different way? Um, so I feel like they backed into a corner actually at certain points because of those practices that, that are there and it just, it just snowballs. Um, that's my biggest reflection. Yeah, with, I, the point about challenging the status quo has been said, though, and maybe sometimes it's, it's so important you have to run risks. And I, I certainly wouldn't bring you in, into the conversation now, but I, I do think that, particularly my experience uh, on, on board appointments, um, is that boards often, when faced with two people of the similar talent, will will defer to the one that on paper has got the most experience even though the other person has the same level of talent and they see that as a risk issue managing risk when quite frankly to your point and i think a bit of boldness here going for raw talent potential with support is equally risky if you don't do Don. yeah hi um, i want to respond to some observations made by the speaker in relation, sorry, not in relation to Bristol City Council, but to exemplify Bristol City Council in a way. There are about 423 local authorities in the country. Each and every one of them is bound by regulations. Every one of them will have an equal opportunity statement. Every one of them will do an equal opportunity assessment when it comes to letting contracts. Each of them will have a set of values. Now the question then is, in each of those local authorities, are they all consistently at a particular level where they're advocates of those values or are they just a passive set of values which reflect a set of regulations and law that they have to abide by? Now in terms of Bristol City Council, Bristol City Council sees itself as a, a part of the broader spectrum of, a, of an anti-racist um, uh, campaign participant in a very, very active way. It's a value-led organisation, and when you talk about values, they can either be passive values or active values. Now, we've, you've heard from Asha Craig this morning, um, the Mayor, I believe, will be speaking later, but the three questions the Mayor always asks, are we treating people with dignity, respect, and what are we doing to empower them? And do we consistently fail or succeed? And it's a mixed bag, but the bottom line is the framework of accountability. When you have a political leadership, um, which all local authorities have and to whom we, people like me are accountable to. The values and leadership comes from the political administration. It's the terms of reference they set. What they do in terms of policy and advocacy sets the behaviour um, terms of reference for every senior officer and that in turn um, influences how we codify recruitment, retention, set our internal objectives take up issues such as um, um, training and development internally to make it a fairer and more accessible place. So the dynamic of equality of opportunities is a constantly changing um, 
uh, landscape, uh, and it's been like that for the last 30 years. Some successes, some failures, some significant setbacks, of which obviously Grenfell is the most tragic one. But as an organisation, it's the role of um, the political administration to set that cultural tone so that there is no hiding place or no room for manoeuvre, whether it's for a senior officer such as myself or for a more uh, junior officer to behave with a lack of respect and dignity towards our residents and communities. And what does treating people like dignity, with dignity and respect actually means? It means that when someone goes into somebody's house for repair, um, they respect the cultural mores present in that household, they carry out the repair in a clean and efficient way, they don't uh, indulge in a behaviour that could be offensive, and they're seen as representatives of the Council's equal opportunity values, as well as being, hopefully, um, solid uh, electricians or, um, or, or craftsmen, whatever shape or form has been um, provided. We have um, a very inconsistent satisfaction rate from our um, residents about the kind of services that we provide. So the question to be asked, which members ask, um, and our cabinet member who's present today, is you know, why is that? Why is it so difficult to be consistent? Why is it so difficult to uh, provide repairs in a, a quick and efficient manner? And why do we have so many complaints? And what are the nature of those complaints? So in my um, brief time at Bristol, uh, relatively brief time, I've had to deal with some real issues of racism, and, um, and they were uh, dealt with, which ultimately um, ended in dismissal. But the energy which goes into that, and, um, and, and the confidence with which one approaches such difficult issues, actually comes from the values which come from the political administration, because they want those issues addressed, they expect officers to be accountable in that regard and to make it happen, not to brush it under the carpet, not to find reasons not to do something because it's too difficult, but to address it and to report it and make it happen. So uh, I would say that Bristol City Council is very much in this region to the forefront of um, leading on anti-racism issues, both in terms of our recruitment and retention. Do we get it wrong? Of course we do. Will we get it wrong in the future? Absolutely. But the thing is, what is the critical mass and what is its direction of travel? And the direction of travel is to promote a more fair and equitable society and how we deliver our services and be transparent and accountable about our decision making. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Una, um, the issues of service provision, and I mean your client group is a client group that probably needs a lot of very specific bespoke support. How, how, how do you work to make sure that you are genuinely providing those services. people need, those your clients need? Yeah. So for those who don't know, um, Brunel Care is a housing association but also a social care provider. So we provide, um, uh, we have over 1,200 colleagues working in care and over 700 of those probably on the entry level in terms of what, you know, salaries, so um, real living wage levels. So if you look at our, if you look at our, uh, um, uh, uh, the number of staff we've got, we've got a high, very high representation of people of colour um, uh, across those grades. So one of the things we wanted to do is really check how that relates to pay and paying conditions. Um, so we've done a race audit, we've done a race equality pay audit, and that's sort of telling us that it's okay. But if we look at our representation of the senior leadership team, it's exactly what <coughs> I was saying, it's still, still not there. So we definitely know we've got more to do in that. But in terms of the service levels, I think that was interesting because, so as well as doing the top down, if you like the cultural work and what you need to do to be an anti-racist um, organisation, it's also picking up what's going on on the ground and having that listening and what's actually, occur you know, what's actually going on on the ground. And one of the things um, that I picked up was that we, we have care homes and we look after people who are um, often at, with advanced dementia. And so uh, probably the majority of those are probably white actually. And some of the views that they espouse and vocalise and talk, and talk to some of our black staff about are quite horrendous actually. But there's been um, perhaps a culture from those staff that they have to accept it. That's just what the way, just the way it is. Those people you can't, you know, if you've got somebody with dementia, you can't say, excuse me, can you just not say that today? But actually what we were doing was supporting those staff and what that felt like mm -hmm. day in, day out to come in and be abused. It's not all the time and I'm sort of, you know, exaggerating a bit, but they were experiencing it, but feeling that's just part of the job. That's just what you have to put up with. And I think when we started to 
we had a we set up a, um, a, a staff forum about, forum about forum. two years listening to people, um, and that was one of the things that came up. And actually, we said no. Actually, you don't have to just accept that. And we can't stop people saying it, but what we can do is support you and what that feels like. So you, you know, you go back, you debrief, you talk to your manager. We can support you in that, and if it's particularly difficult, we'll move you. You know, you don't have to work mm. with those people. So, so it's about addressing some of those real, those, those real things, those real things that people experience every day that just wears you down. Can I mention something else? Of course. Um, and this came up because I know it's coming today. Um, I was walking, I was in London over the weekend and I was walking around the street and I saw so a van turn up and out of this van piled loads of uh, men, people of colour, obviously from all over the world with buckets and they walked into what was either a council block or a housing association block to clean and I thought they don't look like cleaners really, whatever a cleaner looks like and it made me think about modern slavery and how perhaps we are blind as employers, as sub, you know, subcontracting a lot of the work that we do to what's actually going on in our name. And it really made me, I mean, it wasn't, you know, I sort of don't work in London, but I thought, do I know what's actually happening everywhere and who we're employing? And have I got enough checks in place to make sure we're not exploiting people? Now, I don't know they were being exploited, but they looked, you know, it just looked, it didn't look right to me. So I think that's another thing that's that we really can do as, um, as homes, organisations, <laughs> housing associations or, and providers. Really, that, that's just really, rather than an annual statement about modern slavery tick, actually, what does it mean? What we do? Right. And Colin, on that point, I mean, how far does your, your pledge take it? Does it take it down your supply route? You know, the work group should be representative of maybe people from the boards, in your management team, uh, front line staff, tenants, and you're asking yourself those robust questions in relation to the framework here. So just as you said this, in terms of you looking at your supply chain and thinking about the questions you need to, and the, the checks and balances you need to put in place, that's something you would want your, your, your working group to look at. So again, it's about, you know, the organisation challenging itself. Now, that group in, in itself, in time, can document the changes it's made, and you can document the cultural change that you're making with your organisation. So if you kind of like reverse engineer it, kind of like from the future, you can see kind of like where you were to, to where you are, and you can kind of like, you know, justify and verify um, to any stakeholder that, you know, yeah. for that process. Now we, uh, on our assessment board, which is the second level, we get external verification for that, for that to come in. But, Essentially, it's not a tick box to say. It's really about the intention and the attitude of the organisation. If you're going to come on it just for it to be a tick, tick box to say, then we, we don't want you there. We want people with integrity to be really going to take the tick box. Thank you. And then on this point of validation, I guess the biggest validation you can have is when your customers are telling you what they're experiencing. And all the way through today, we've heard about um, people just not being listened to. And, and let's listen. Let's, let's reflect on what, what we might be doing that's working and things that probably aren't working that we need to learn from, particularly for those silent majority of customers that we just simply don't hear from. Is anyone prepared to maybe talk a little bit about that, that side of service provision? I think that we might think that this is going to sort out the challenges that it's meant to sort out. The top of the organisation, the board and the executive teams, I'm not going to go on about a fractured system and be defensive, but have got responsibility for ensuring that, I mean, I'll give you a good example. Every year we sit on the board and we have the same conversation about our cost per unit, the way we compare with others is much higher, it's top quartile. Yes, we spend more on repairs than average. Why? Because we believe we should invest in our customers' homes with our profits. So, we have the same conversation, and so I think it's really important that we don't oversimplify it as leaders, that the, the problems that we're facing, the systemic issues, the damp and mold, the not hearing customers, you know, if we really heard customers well, we'd be brilliant, we'd be like, uh, you know, we'd be ace at repairs, wouldn't we? Doing repairs right has been the number one issue that every customer has said since I started working in housing, and yet we still see a mediocre at best approach. So there's something about 
that really, how do, we, how, do we, how do we do that? So I absolutely am all for CIA and professionalism, but I just think we just need to be careful that we don't push it into a solution that is not going to solve. For, for me, the test is, um, um, tenant, you've got to remind yourself that tenants are a very forgiving lot, because they have to put up with quite a lot. <laughs> and um, the question for them is, um, do they have trust in the com uh, and confidence in the organisation's prevailing culture? Is it one that is truly inclusive, that will treat people equally and provide them the services they deserve? And if they feel that's not present, then they um, will never ever uh, be able to work uh, proactively with tenants in, a, in an environment of, of, of trust and confidence. And for me, as I said at the very outset, that comes from the values of your organisation. And those values, in my case, or Bristol City's case are set by the political administration. Thank you. And finally, Una, last thoughts. He's going to ask me a difficult question. No, 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 no. I was going to, I, the last thought really is about what's been your biggest takeaway, you I think, from really today? I really thank Alex for prompting this in the first place, Paul picking it up, setting up today. There's an enormous amount of work that he's got us in the room, got us talking. I think big takeaway is about the, what everyone else has said, plus that. Um, training and development and what we did and what we lost 30 years ago, we did it then, why can't we do it again? Um, and um, I've got board chair vacancy. So <laughs> there you go. Some people in the room, but also um, the stepping up and, and, and use that as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so we've done all our, our vacancy adverts. So it's, um, I'd like you all please to uh, uh, big, give a big round of applause to the panel members. Thank you.